Well, welcome everybody to the session today, which is called Know What Files Matter the Most. My name is Richard Kamata. I'm a senior sales engineer and solutions principal with Novel. Uh, I'm a product leadership team member for what's called Files and Access, which covers uh, Novel File Reporter, it covers Novel Storage Manager, and it calls Novel Filer. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go through a scenario that shows you how to use two of our leading solutions to help you figure out which files matter the most. This becomes increasingly important because as we go through um, different implementations of, of uh, things we want to get done in our work, either archiving files or off to nearline storage or getting prepared for a large filer implementation, um, we might have a lot of files out there that need to be looked at and to be determined whether it's, they're still an active part of our network. We also might want to look into things such as compliance and auditing, and we'll cover all of these things in the next 40 minutes or so. So without further ado, uh, this does this look like your typical office? Uh, it may not look like your physical office, although it might look a little bit like mine at home. However, uh, what we're trying to display here is that if I were to ask you folks here, and I don't expect you to answer on, on this uh, particular webinar, although you're, you're welcome to put in some comment in the chat if you wish, how, uh, how long has your network been in place in your environment, in, in your company? Has it been there for five years? Has it been there less than five years? Has it been 10 years in place? Or has it been 20 years or more? If you're like the young lady in this photo here, uh, you probably have had networks that's been out there for more than a decade or perhaps more than two decades. And uh, the accumulated amount of files that go into that network start to become a little difficult to keep track of. Uh, for instance, if you have people that leave the company, if they uh, get fired, if they leave on their own, if they change jobs or change locations, there's files that might be left around in, in their network uh, home storage area or part of the things they do in the department that uh, are clearly out of your control to know what files still matter, what files are relevant, which ones can be deleted, which ones should be archived off. So it's very difficult um, to go into a system that's been there anywhere longer than five years and really determine how many files are still active or play an active role in your company. For instance, I got a new MacBook in 2011. So I've only had this for three years. I currently have over 600 megabytes of files on here. Uh, I can't tell, or sorry, 600 gigabytes actually of files and applications. I couldn't tell you honestly which ones are still current and which ones are not other than what I've covered the last three months. And most people's experience is that more than three or six months in, in the background, you can't really determine what files are still relevant for uh, your day-to-day -day work. I, I'm just going to stop for a second. I think I have a question here. Oh, I have somebody who said 10 years and another one who said 15 years. So Steve Hesser had has his out there for 15 years. So I'm going to comment about Steve here. It's difficult to see what files in this whole file scenario are still relevant for your work on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them you'll know, but frankly, quite a few you will not. And that's a current problem. On an IT perspective, uh, your IT uh, personnel are kind of asking, is there a better way to manage this file system? Is there a better way to manage files and, and directories? And by the way, I just want to use a, a comment that was made in a, in a Gartner survey in 2011 or 2012. I may have the date wrong, but they were saying that more and more files have become significantly relevant again. I mean, I don't know how many people out there are, are using uh, SharePoint today or, or some other type of collaborative solution. People thought that once we started getting the collaborative solutions that we would have less and less need for day-to-day -day storage on, on uh, mass service out there. But frankly, uh, the use of server store has been come, becoming more and more increased uh, as time goes forward. I mean, we're just not reducing the amount of uh, data space we're taking for files and storage. So if you look at your typical IT person, they're managing those files. They're being asked to try to reduce the storage that's out there. They don't really have a handle, though, on what files are there if they don't have a tool that tells them what files are relevant and which files are not. Uh, another challenge we have here is that uh, you go in and you have uh, an employee that comes in and it's a new hire, and you're asked to go in and set them up. Now, they might be a hire in HR. They might be uh, 
in Mahogany Row, they might be a director, a senior to yourself, and you've got a network upgrade to do, you've got other things on your mind, and this person says, well, no, I, I need to get set up today, I'm starting my job. Uh, in most companies, this is a manual process, which means you get distracted from what you're doing, you have to take the time to fill this request, and then get back to what you were initially doing. The problem with this is it leaves you lots of gaps for security risks, to uh, properly set up the, the rights improperly, there could be any number of things that could go wrong. So they're, they're really asking, is there a better way to do this? Well, from a, a customer side, from, from the IT's customer side, they're, they're not always finding this easy as well. If I look at the young lady in this photo here, she might have inherited a role from somebody else. So she inherits a new role, but she's trying to do her job and she's trying to get access to files that are sitting in a department folder somewhere and she gets all these messages. You know, I can't find the file, possibly because I don't have the rights. I don't have the read permissions on it. Or maybe I don't have enough rights to use the file specifically. So uh, this person's getting a little frustrated. They're going to go back to our friend who's working in IT and he's going to have to go in and readdress the rights so that this person can do their job appropriately. So altogether, it could be a little bit daunting for people. Now from a finance side, if I look at my people here, Dave Gallo is, is working in a company and uh, he's the CFO, he's the finance guy. And he's approached by Michael and Michael turns around and says, uh, yeah, I need to plan my, my storage for 2015, so how much budget do I have? And the finance guy, Dave, says, well, I could probably give you enough money to buy another uh, five terabytes of storage. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. I'll go for five terabytes to start. And uh, Dave budgets for five, or Dave budgets for five terabytes. Michael says that's good. 2015 starts. They have some new employee hires. They got new projects, and within three months, boom, the storage is completely used. So Michael goes back to Dave and says, uh, you know what I asked you for that five terabytes? I probably should have said 50 terabytes. I didn't ask you for enough storage. Well, now Michael's turning around and saying, well, wait a minute, why are we buying all this new data store? We've had people leave our organization. We've had files that haven't been used for years. Isn't there a way for us to determine what we don't need on there, get it backed onto tape, and have this figured out in a different fashion? Now, from a security perspective, when you're looking at security and auditing and compliance, which quite a few companies have to worry about uh, things like Sarbanes-Oxley, Pipetta, uh, FIPS, there's uh, all sorts of different things out there that may cover um, a need for you to have an audit and compliance trail for your files. So there's a lot of tools out there that do forensics on you know, people's rights and what's being managed and so on. So that's usually covered quite well. But when it comes to the file system itself, how do we determine if everybody has the appropriate permissions that are required and don't have too many per permissions? How do we do an audit trail to validate who has access to what and how they got to that? So these are things that are, are, are being asked by security, but there's not a lot of tools that are well known at least that can answer that for you. I'm gonna take a second to pause and see if anybody has a question for me. All right, I'll keep going. So fortunately for the folks on this uh, webinar, there are solutions out there that we can help you with. We call it Novell File Management Suite, but the first thing I want to do is just mention that's a bit of a misnomer. It's not really File Management Suite. It's it, There's a set of products, but they can be bought individually. And in that set of products, the two we're going to focus on uh, help you manage files better, get a, a better handle on what, what's being what's been happening with those files and rights, what's the movements been with them, and it makes it significantly less expensive to go in and set up users and maintain their rights. And we're gonna show you that uh, once we go through the presentation. So let's take a look at this for a moment. We have a new hire here, Cindy Claus. She works at the finance department. She was hired in, in the New York office, and she gets started on a Monday. And we're going to show you that in four clicks, this very resourceful person is going to be switched to a different job. However, in a typical environment, what's going to be the steps here if I'm going to hire this person? I hire this person. If I'm fortunate and I have an identity management solution in place, that person's uh, user ID and rights are going to be dissipated uh, and sent to uh, the identity vault. 
They'll be uh, going from the authoritative source to give access to her finance stuff, to get access to uh, anything she needs resource-wise, and make sure that her login credentials are matched across the system. However, where do we have the gap? The gap happens when she needs to get access to the file system. So typically, all of the rights are managed from an identity vault perspective, and then the fi or sorry, and then the IT person is asked to manually go in and create Cindy's rights and set them up for access within the file system itself, whether that be Windows or whether that be OES or whether that be both. So then that person takes a manual sheet, usually a checklist sheet, and sets up the rights appropriately for Cindy, uh, which is a manual process, which we know means there's room for human error. So let's watch what happens if we put in a solution, for, ins for instance, such as Storage Manager, and have the same thing happen. So this is, a, this is an example of a user who has a tool called Storage Manager. They get hired, the Identity Vault creates everything on the security side, and then an event is triggered, which is listened to by Storage Manager, and the following happens. The user gets hired, the event monitor picks it up, they get created, and we have a home directory that's automatically created. We can give them access strictly to the finance department. And we go a little further. We can go in and, and provide them with the documents they need to start their job. Now, I've been fortunate. I've only had about uh, six or seven jobs in my lifetime. But uh, how many people have been in the situation where you get to a new job, you're all enthusiastic to get started, you're waiting for that computer to be ordered, and you want to have access to your systems, and it takes you sometimes two days, a week, two weeks, sometimes even longer before you have all the accesses you require. And more frustratingly, your boss tells you he wants you to work on something or she wants you to work on something. You go into a file folder and lo and behold, you don't have the rights that are necessary. But with this system here, the user's created, the rights to do the job are automatically distributed for that person. So let's go through the next phase of Cindy's career. She's only been there about three clicks, and already she gets a, pro a promotion, and she's going to be moved to the London office. So let's watch and see what happens. She gets promoted, and she goes through here, and oh, sorry, she she uh, oh my my graphic didn't move away here. She gets promoted. She switched to the London office. We revoke the access to the finance service. We give her access to HR in the London department. And lo and behold, uh, all of her rights from finance are, are revoked. Her rights are given for her to be within the, the HR department in London. And guess what? All of her files are moved from the finance department in New York automatically to the London location. So she's ready to go the day she gets off that plane and starts her new job. Other things that we can do for you, we can make it just simply less expensive by validating and auditing what's out there with another solution we have in there called File Reporter. And what File Reporter allows you to do, it allows you to determine what files are out there. When have they been last accessed? Do I have duplicate files? What are my rights and permissions? Uh, do I have files that are considered on my blacklist within the company? In other words, I don't want them on my network whatsoever. Um, in this small graphic here, you're seeing an example of top 10 file owners by size which means I can go in there and see who specifically are the heavy users of my file systems or which departments are. I have other report, reports that will let me, uh, once I figure out what those are, I can use my storage management utility, something else I'll show you, to go in and do a grooming rule. So for instance, in the top 10 owners of files, if I found files that were executables, AVIs or movies, for instance, somebody was using this like a, a giant iPod, I can automatically have those cleared off and put to a vault and then decide whether I want to delete them after a specific period or archive them all together. And uh, I can also see what my security is. One of the questions we put up there is, how secure are my files? So with this file reporter part of the teal tool, I can go in and determine who has what rights to what subdirectories. And furthermore, I can determine how they got those rights whether it was a direct or indirect access. So uh, how was that person assigned these different rights? And lastly, I can go in and see, do I have one of my employees that are using this as, a, as their personal iPod or movie service? I mean, we're not supposed to be replacing uh, 
Netflix out there. If I were to look at this and just, you know, do a quick poll to my users on this call, do you think that the free ride and Hotel California and Purple Haze are part of this person's everyday job? It's possible. Might be they're in marketing and they're building something up. But it's more than likely that this person is using this uh, file server, uh, the data store, inappropriately. So with File Reporter, we can, we can determine. And with Storage Manager, we can react. Once we get through all this, of course, uh, we have a user community that's much more happy and an IT director that's much more happy as well because there's less headaches going on. So that concludes the presentation component of my, uh, my slide. Or, or my presentation. I will now switch to the demo, but I will take a moment to pause and see if anybody has questions for me. Okay, it would appear there's no questions at this present time. So let me walk you through a bit of a scenario here. Actually, just give me a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose a name here. I'm gonna choose uh, Benny George here, and Benny, we're gonna walk you through being a new employee in our company. So I'll just take a, a moment for my screen to refresh. And what what I'm gonna show you here first is I'm gonna walk you through what happens, and then I'll walk you through how we make it happen. So um, from the first perspective. What I have here is I have a Windows uh, 2012 server. Um, I could have been showing this on OES, of course, but uh, for those of you that uh, have been fans of Novell for a long time, uh, such as myself, I installed my first Novell network in 83, still a huge fan. We know that we can do this on OES, or we expect we can. So uh, what I'll do is I'll show you the same exercise, but I'm going to show you this off of a Windows server. So the scenario I'm going to go through is exactly like Cindy Claus. I'm going to go in here. And I'm going to create a user and have that user automatically provisioned through an event-driven monitoring system called storage management. Now, I mentioned that it's kind of like the last link in something called an identity management solution. What I should stress here is that it, you don't require having uh, an identity solution for this to work. And in my case here, I don't need to have identity manager to get this working. Um, I can do it just with the tools at hand. So I have my Windows service, or I've got my Novell service. I install Storage Manager, and from there you'll see how we can uh, automate things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Atlanta Users folder here. I'm going to open up the home directory so you can see my user list. And I'm also going to go to Atlanta Employees on this side and let you see my user list. So actually, let me create a different user. I was going to use uh, George, but we'll use a different one here. And you'll see how this works out. So uh, I'm going to go and create this person. And we'll give them a login ID. I'm creating them in the Atlanta Employees subdirectory. So uh, we go in, we set up that person's name. Um, I'm going to go in and put a password for that person, something very secure, such as Novell. And what I'll do here is I'll, I'll take off the force password. Now, what's what's going to happen? Currently, I don't have a, a user called Chris here. I don't have a Chris user. Um, I don't have a Chris user here as well. So I'm going to hit Next, and we'll say Finish. And within a few moments, so there's my user showing up here. But we should see that within a few moments, on the other side, my user should be created automatically uh, and, and have their home directory established. So sometimes it takes a couple of secs, but we should see that happen uh, shortly. Again, I'll take a moment to see if anybody has a question for me. That should start to happen right about now. And there we go. There's my user ID. Um, I'm going to take a moment to open that up because I said that we can do more than just provision a user's home directory and make sure that, make sure those rights are correct. If I open Chris's uh, uh, ID up here is, is folder. You can see I have something called approved audio files. I've got approved video files, and I've got an Atlanta employee kit. There's also a welcome to the Atlanta office doc. Now, I mentioned to you I've, I've been through a few jobs within my career, and I love to have gotten a welcome letter that explains to me, you know, uh, where, where the coffee services are, how the lunch cafeteria works, uh, who my reporting structure is, 
uh, how to find HR information. Uh, I'd love to have an Atlantic employee kit that lets me figure out what my comp company policies are. And by the way, have it pre-populated with expense forms so I can auto automatically know where to go and get that information or HR forms so I can start filling information for my kids' braces or for uh, uh, dental work for myself or eyeglasses for the wife. So all of that being uh, automatically populated. Now that's one part of what we discussed, that employee being created and then automatically having access to the files and folders. Right there, what have I done? I've removed the risk factor from the IT director or sorry, the IT uh, administrator who's creating the user because the minute I use an automated system like this, all I have to do is test the use scenarios for a specific directory or group or department, make sure that they, they follow the, the rights, follow the mask that I want them to follow, and then every user afterwards that I create automatically has the same consistent access, making it safe, making it auditable, and making it uh, much more easy on the administration. Now, I'm going to go here and I'm going to take Chris and just like uh, like uh, 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 Cindy, I'm going to take this person and I'm going to move them to a different department. So I'm going to take Chris. I'm going to physically move Chris over to London here and watch what's going to happen. Ignore that warning for a second. I've just gone in and I moved Chris to uh, London. So there he is. And watch what's going to happen here on the home directory front. Chris is there currently, but we're going to see that Chris is going to move along with his plane ride. And it takes a lot less hour than the six to seven hour flight to London. Within a few uh, moments, we're going to see that that user ID is going to disappear and it's going to end up in the London employee group instead. So we'll just give that a second. And again, I'm going to take a moment to pause and wait for questions. So let me just go to my question screen and see if anybody had a question for me. Okay, currently I don't see any questions, so I'll continue. So we saw that Chris disappeared, and if we go to the London users here and open that up, we see that now Chris is a member of the London uh, department uh, across the, the uh, pond. His files have been moved with him, and by the way, if I open them up, at this point, we haven't decided to remove the older Atlanta stuff because perhaps there's things in there that that person still requires. But we have the London employee kit. We have the welcome to London message. Obviously, I could have had another policy to remove those things. But we can see here that the information is currently uh, moved forward. Now, what if Chris had a limited job? What if Chris was only a temporary employee and worked, let's say, from uh, December 24th until uh, early December 26, and then after that was no longer a user. Well, we have another policy that we can do that can vault uh, all of the information for that person once that person's no longer employed. And we can do this, by the way, on a schedule, or we can do it based on an event. So we're going to go to Chris, and we're going to say that he's, uh, he's, he's physically finished his job, so we're just going to remove that user. And what you're going to see here is I'm going to remove Chris because he's finished work the 26th, and we're going to see in a moment that Chris is going to disappear from here. Now, this is something also that helps you with a lot of different security risks. It automatically keens up that, that, that person's information, so if they're let go or if they resign themselves, I've got that information moved away where it's no longer on the, the main server, it's no longer taking valuable storage space, but more importantly, I'm ensuring that I have no security risks once again. But what happened to this information? Well, I could have chosen to do one of two things. I can physically delete all that information, uh, or I can have it backed up and then delete it, or I could do something else. And what I did, chose to do in this particular system is do something else. So what we're, we, we've done is we've got this vault here, uh, and in this vault drive, the archive, we have something called deleted users, now, uh, or sorry, inactive users. And in the active user, inactive users, uh, I'm, I'm going brain dead here. In the London, in the London directory here, uh, I've got my inactive users, and that's where Chris Kringle ended up. So all his information would have still been there, but it's moved from the uh, London user home directory to the vault put into the users here, or it could have been put into deleted users, but in this case into London, and we find Chris sitting right there. So this is a bit about the magic behind Storage Manager. 
So I'm just going to take a moment to show you how we had that happen. Um, so I'm going to go and close these. And I'm going to go to the storage manager over here and we'll open up the uh, interface. Now this is the, the storage manager interface. You can see in this example, I actually have two different ones. I've got one free directory and one for active directory. Other than that, the engine, all the back end pieces, the agents are all the same. However, to manage this environment, I need a different management console for both uh, e directory and for active directory. Uh, this is what's called the main console or the dash page, the front, the front dashboard that shows us the different things. Um, I've got in here this option called policy net management. In policy management, this is where we set up all the magic that allowed uh, those things to happen automatically. So for instance, if I were to go in here and double click on Atlanta employees and walk through this, this is where we see the associations that are automatically configured by storage manager and we can see how they're provisioned. This is where we put in those tem templates for them. Uh, I can set up my target path for our, where I want that created. Uh, quota options if I wanted to give quota options and in this case I do. Now, why would I want a quota option? Uh, within uh, within storage manager and not just use the one within Windows or, or OES. Well, the, the simple truth is I'm removing another task from the administration person and perhaps putting that burden on either a, a, a different uh, help desk employee or perhaps on a manager in a department. So I can put in a specific quota and then I can have that quota augmented by somebody who knows the work patterns of the users. So let's go on the actual Atlanta user homes here and if I go to those quota options, in this example, we'll see I've got a maximum quota of 100 megabytes and I've got a minimum quota of 50. Now, obviously, these figures are for my demo server. I can't give a ton of space here. But what this allows you to do is this specific user in this case here is able to manage the quota on, on, that, uh, on the users that are in their department. So once they hit the 50 megabyte uh, uh, limit or get close, that person can decide in increments of 25 megs to increase and, and add extra quota without having to manage or, or sorry to uh, disturb the administrator. Uh, we've got uh, this concept called move schedule which means if I'm going to do the move like I did with Chris Kringle earlier and I moved from Atlanta to London I could have said well I want this move to happen at a different time I don't want it to disrupt my users during the day and of course I talked about vault rules so in this case we have one specific vault rule assigned with the Atlanta users directory which means if I have any TMP files I don't want them lying around I just want those files to be automatically deleted out because I don't require them they're temp files so that's just a little walk through on, on how those policies look and of course the, the London users policy or home directory policy is going to look uh, very similar so if I walk through you're going to see uh, that it's you know the same. This uh, HR employees folder, by the way, it's considered an auxiliary policy. In other words, once I create the user, that's how I get in and I create that HR employees folder to give them access to the additional information they require. So that's a bit from the policy editor perspective. Of course, we can do a lot more with this. Uh, we have this concept called scheduled tasks where I can go in and do uh, storage resource discovery to see if I've got no new resources out there. Uh, you'll see I've got this option called data migration, so I can move data, data from one server to another server if I so wished, if it was set up to do that. Um, and in management actions, I've got a few interesting things I can do. Uh, when I told you that we can use this solution to validate actions before they're made, met live, it's through this type of screen that I'm referring to it. I can actually go and create policies. And I can use what's called, uh, in this example, run in check mode. And I can run a policy, do it in check mode, make sure that all of the expected behaviors are happening. And then when, it, when I'm sure that it's working the way I want it to work, I can uncheck the check mode and make sure that uh, that gets executed. So let me give you an example here of one of the things we can do, which is called a consistency check. What a consistency check does is it makes sure that all my rights and policies are applied adequately for what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to go, go ahead and browse my tree and I'll go into uh, the Atlanta container which is somewhere under here and I'll take that and I can either double click on it or I can drag it so I'll just go here and go add 
And what we're going to do here is we're going to run a consistency check and see how the writes look within, uh, within our uh, environment. So I'll just go ahead and do a run. And if I look at that, uh, you can see here that um, all, all that little green check means that my users are, are managed. I can see the management stat. I can see their quota. I can see if anybody had additional quota. For instance, there's one user here that had a, a little more quota added in. Uh, and I can make sure that their rights are all the same. And of course they are because we've applied a policy to it. So I can see that they're actually policy driven. Their paths are matching the way they should. And I can drill down specifically on a specific user if I wanted to and do additional things as well. So that's uh, one of the things we can do through. Uh, we can also enforce policy paths. We can uh, use a template and apply uh, apply specific rights at large. Like if I wanted to, I could go in and click on a couple of users and apply a specific rights on those users through this management action. So that's just a, a quick run through on what storage management does. It can go much further, of course. Other things that we can do with this, um, I, I'm not encouraging anybody to do this and certainly you would uh, you would make me sad this close to the holidays but if any of you were considering to move from oes to a windows environment there's a few tools that are out there of course you have a tool from quest that exists that allows you to do a move and migration there's other companies that do it as well uh, storage manager can also provide the ability to do uh, a migration move um, so again, not that I'm encouraging you to do it, but if you use Quest or other tools, quite often you're paying a lot of money and you're taking the tool and the tool is just being thrown away once it's done. With this tool here, we can also do uh, what's called cross-empire data migration. And when, when, we, when we do that cross-empire uh, cross data migration with this tool, we can match all of the different users' rights. We can match um, the names between the two. Make sure that uh, Kris Kringle is the same as Santa Claus in the other tree. And then we can start to uh, move over the file system and ensure that the rights are all staying in the same place, that they're staying the way they should be. So I can have those rights moved across with cross our data migration. However, what happens once my move is finished? Once my move is finished, I'm able to go in and physically, uh, so that would be my source tree. I can do the identity map. I, I can uh, go in and see, uh, uh, put in my two trees. Once the move is finished, however, I still have this tool to go ahead and do all that policy management uh, for the things I showed you, such as the home directories and so on. So it becomes a much more larger and useful tool. I'm going to take a second and close this. And again, I'm going to pause and see if anybody has questions for me and take a sip of my water here. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any additional questions. So now let me show you the other component that I wanted to talk about, which is auditing compliance and figuring out what you have there. So Storage Manager is the tool that lets you execute and move things the way you want, set up your rights the way you they should be consistent, do things such as quota management. This next part that I'm going to show you is File Reporter, which is the new version, File Reporter 2.5, which is going to allow you to go in there and do reports. Now, I have to tell you, there's a very huge difference between File Reporter 2.5 and earlier versions of File Reporter. Uh, in this version, as well as in older versions, we always had the right to go in, create reports, and, uh, or, and have these reports uh, peruse on the data that's collected uh, through the scans that File Reporter executes. Now, the way this works is I've got, a, I've got the File Reporter engine, and I've got these agents or proxy agents that go in and they dredge all of the file information on every one of your servers and volumes, and they put that into a single database. Now, we have a, we have a built-in Postgres database that we use with this, as you can see in this example, but within 2.5, I can also use Microsoft SQL or the, or the, the, uh, the mini SQL from Microsoft. If I so wish, if I have uh, Microsoft admins for databases and that makes it easier, I can do that. The other thing that's new in here and pretty cool 
is in the older versions, I had about uh, 20 or 30 ver you know, canned reports. Not a big deal. I mean, uh, they, they were pretty uh, efficient. I can get rights permissions. I can get duplicate file entries. I can get all sorts of different things out of here. However, um, I didn't have the ability to take additional information and create myself uh, additional type of reports. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we were in Brainshare in November, there was a, a, one of our customers who came to our booth and said, you know what, I was hit recently with a virus that goes in and puts an unencrypt line in every one of my files. Would this have been able to help me with? Uh, would I have been able to get help on that with this? Well, in the older version, the information might have been captured, but there was no way to expose it. Because in this new version, we allow you to do what's called custom query reports. And the custom query reports allow me to go in and uh, create reports that are specific to things I need to find out. So when this customer was, was there, we asked him to come back in a half hour or so, and we were able to create quickly a custom report that went in and searched specifically for that unencryption uh, comment in the files. And we were able to show them that we could, yes, with this, dredge the different servers and volumes and find all reports that might have been affected. So you can see here I've got 20 different scan policies already defined, and uh, we can see that they're all sitting here, um, uh, and, and they all provide me with different views of my system. I've got my Atlanta file system. I've got volume-free space, which tells me what space is available and so on. I've got permission scans, so I can go in and start seeing if my user's rights are set up appropriately or not. Um, so I can go in and do all sorts of different types of reporting. Without further ado, why don't I click on one or two and, and just take a look uh, at what's available. So again, I went into reports, go to report definitions, and I can go in here. Uh, you see here this example, this is one of the custom reports done with uh, a, a query system instead, uh, a custom query builder. And by the way, we give you uh, a tool in there that helps you walk through and build those queries for you. So you don't have to be an MSQL or, or Microsoft SQL database guru to run this. We provide you with a with a, an SQL statement builder as part of the product. And here's an example. I can create a custom one called find that unencrypted virus. Or I can go in here and do things such as, why don't I take a look at if I've got uh, music and video files. So if I were to run this, uh, I'll get a detailed report out here. Uh, for some reason, this one's gone walking on me. Let's try a different one. Uh, if I go in here, I'm not sure why that one was doing that. Let's go into this one here and look at the shares and extensions. And you see this option here called Top 10 Extensions by Size. So just like we saw in my demonstration, I could go in here and physically look at what my top 10 file uses are. And it shouldn't be a surprise that my executables and my MP4s my my temp files they're they're kind of my larger file users and the mp3s aren't far from them as well so just by one click here i'm already seeing what files are kind of taking up my space but if i go into the report data itself i can do even more cool things i can go in and say hmm i've got all these different files but for instance where where are those executables coming from you notice my button gets hot here again i can click on this exe for instance and it will automatically generate an additional report that goes in and shows me specifically who has those executable files and where they are and what they are. So I can see who owns them and what files are specifically there. And all I did to get there was I went in and I, I just clicked on that, uh, the, sorry, I didn't want to go there, I'll go there after. I just clicked on that, uh, the, that file name and it was able to go in and go for that. And I could do that with any one of these file types. I can go and be specific to an EML file. I could be specific to uh, MP3 files or whatnot. So I can go a little further here, say I want to know who's got MP3 files. And if I look at this, I look at my report data, hmm, I've got a couple of my users that I think are starting to use this as, a, uh, as an iPod, a personal iPod. So uh, that's something that we can go in with storage manager afterwards and clear out the files. Now, if you recall back to my demo, I did have these things called um, acceptable audio files, acceptable video files, where we can let files that are company uh, approved stay in there. All other ones, we can create a policy that'll uh, automatically dredge those, put them in a vault somewhere and delete them eventually. By the way, 
by default, I set this up for PDF, but I can also save this as an XLS file. I can save it as a text or CSV file. Uh, there's plenty of file formats uh, that I can save it in if I want to go in and, and uh, uh, use a different uh, system to, to look at the data, data and, and peruse it. So let me close this and just go in here and take a look at how one of these look, like duplicate files, for instance. This is a, an example of the duplicate file screen. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm looking for a, a name match. I'm looking for a time modification stamp. And I can go in and add the different targets that I want to uh, look at and see if those things uh, uh, exist. And of course, I can apply policies to this as well. So again, that, that was for this duplicate file one. I'll go a little slower and show that. So I can see what, again, are my top 10 duplicates by file type. Oh, and by the way, this probably has never happened to you, right? Where you go into your network and you have people that get something emailed to them or whatnot, and then they say, hey, I've got a couple of really cool things that are uh, sent my way by email, and I'd love to share them with you. So all of a sudden, that uh, mail server you had that just became a file copier server for you gives you a ton of different files that don't really have anything to do with work. So if I go in the data here and I look at what these files are, uh, for instance, if I look at this golf uh, instruction video, Hmm, I got three copies of this. I don't even want one copy of it, but I can click on there and I can see who, in fact, is the culprit that has it. Now, for some reason, I got a little bit of a performance lag here, but typically, if I give this enough time, it's going to come up and show me who has physically got that file. So for the sake of time, I'll keep going on that. Oh, yes, and I can brand the report specifically to my company and so on. So to create a new one, I just go in here. And I can give it a name, and I can say uh, uh, Christmas files. I can say that I want either summary. How do I want to do this by Christmas files? I want to say, well, I want to know uh, a summary of the files, or uh, file extension will go with. And I can uh, say OK here. And I go in, and I could add my volumes. So I just go in and choose which volumes you see I've got either the Windows tree and the e-directory tree because I can compare to oh sorry about that I can compare to uh, what happened there I can compare to both give me a moment to get back here so I can I can go in here and choose a volume out of my Windows side or a couple of volumes I can also do the same thing from my OES side and I can do the comparison on both, add them as part of my targets, and I can put in filters if I so wish. So if I wanted a filter for specific and or, you know, different conditions, uh, I can go on uh, relative, relative creation dates, so I can put uh, different dates and times that I want to uh, do the report on. And once I'm, a, I'm okay with all my different parameters, I've got that new report sitting there. So... Um, and it should be there somewhere here. Christmas report. Uh, where did I put it? Oh, there we go. Christmas file. So I, I didn't. I'm not even sure if I set it up appropriately, but I guess I did. And there's my top ten extensions uh, by file size, and of course the report date that it's there. And again, like I said, I can go in and uh, drill down afterwards. So that's a very brief view. I've got one other thing I want to show you if I may, and that's going in here and looking at the quota management. And I'm hoping I, I still remember this person's password. And if I do, what I want to do is just show you the view of the quota manager. So hopefully, I'll remember that password. And what this allows you to do is if I, if I did implement a staggered quota where I have a, a local department head perhaps manage what, quotas, uh, what quota is... Uh, needed for their, their users. I can go in here and do um, some sort of a, a uh, search here and find my different users and click on them and see what kind of storage information they have. Here I can see I've got 49% of that person available. Um, if I wanted to, I could go in and augment their quota. In the case of this person, I didn't really need to. I can find all my different users, of course, by just doing an asterisk and submit. 
and see all of the different users out here. Click on one of them and see what their space is. We can see they pretty much all have uh, a lot of free space till about 48%. Uh, but I could go in there afterwards and uh, add additional quota if required through this utility. So that was a very brief, and I do, I do understand it was a very brief overview of what this product can do. I'm going to take a moment again and see, do any of you have any questions for me before we end this for the Christmas holidays, or the holidays in general, quite frankly? My goodness, I'm talking away and I realized it was on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, if I look at the specific question, in this case from Dave Gallo, he's asking how do we know uh, specifically, um, how do we preserve the quotas? Well, by putting this together, Dave, I apply the policy to all my users in the group or all my users at large, and that policy will go in and force the quota to be applied to all of the volumes which are targeted by the, the, the policy rule you put in place. They won't be able to exceed that quota. The quota is managed uh, through the, uh, the policy manager in NSM. All I'm able to do is allow the department head to increment the, uh, the, the, the quota if they're given the right to do that. So hopefully that answered your question. And if not, uh, please feel free to reach out and email me. Now, another question here from Cyril. Does Porter need, need automatically an agent on the servers? I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Cyril. No, I don't necessarily need an agent. And in the past, with the earlier versions, we recommended that as, as much as possible, you have an agent uh, on the physical servers. That's not always possible. For instance, with a network server, I can't put an agent on there. I need to use a proxy. So uh, what you can do is, is, is use a proxy agent. I suggest that you have it on the same subnet as those servers for performance reasons. But the good news is, especially with File Reporter 2.5, I've got close to, well, definitely better than 90% the same performance as if the agent was physically on that uh, machine. So the performance is certainly not compromised uh, at all. So uh, that I hope, hopefully that will answer your question. Uh, uh, what was the next one? Uh, no happy holiday? Absolutely happy holiday. Uh, okay. Will the slide deck be available to view after? Absolutely. And by the way, this is being recorded, so you can also get an access to the recording. Although it has a bit of a holiday flair to it, hopefully it will be useful. Uh, and uh, thanks. Okay. Um, I was all tabbed to another screen. Do you have – oh, did I show the heat map? I'm asked by one of my colleagues. That's a good point. I did not. Uh, so I'm going to take a minute and do that since I have eight minutes left. Um, one of my colleagues was asked whether or not I showed the heat map. So I just have to remember where I have that on here. Uh, I do have it somewhere. Uh, where did I put it? Tom, if I can remember where it is, I'll certainly show it. Uh, where do we have that? 
Uh, let me do a search. No, it's not showing up as that. I, I've been asked to show another really cool feature, and I know I have it on here. I'm just trying to see where it is. It's called uh, the heat map, which is a really cool way to look at your drive. So I'm just trying to see where it would be here. I don't seem to be finding it. Um, go to my desktop again. It was in one of these folders, I think. Oh, here, here we go. So what he was asking about is there's this really cool tool that we include with this version called a heat map, which lets you go in and look at who's, who's using uh, what with their files in a graphical point of view. Now in 2.5, this is more of a technology preview, but it is still pretty cool. For instance, if I click on data age here, I'm trying to click on date age. Uh, okay, I'll have to load from file, actually. Um, oh, that's not going to do it. For some reason, sorry, Tom, for some reason it's not triggering off here. So uh, go from here. Oh, maybe I need to put in my password. It's been a while since I've done this, so I apologize if it's a little goofy. Uh, there we go. So what, what we're doing here is we're able to go in and, and start to manage this through a heat map. Now, I, I probably picked a bad example there. Let's go to file extension. In file extension here with the heat map, what it's letting you do is across all of my volumes in the entire network, it's letting me go in and see a graphical view of what my files are. Now, what we're going to try to do with this is over time, you're going to be able to do all of your management just by clicking in and drilling down on one of these sections in the heat map. So you see here, I've got a ton of TMP files. They take a lot of my space. I've got these JPEG files that are sitting there. I've got uh, some PDF files that are taking some space and some doc files. Now, kind of interestingly enough, my doc files are taking less space than, for instance, things such as my TMP files. So once I go into this, I'm able to go in and, and drill down on information as things go, go forward. I can go in here and look at specifics and see uh, what's going on in my different areas. So I can go in and look at owners. I can look at the age of those files. And what it's telling you here on the graph is uh, by size, uh, how much space that's taking or by aging of the files. Now this example here, it's I don't have the parameters set up properly, so it goes black, but that's one of the options that you can do. And again, this is a technology preview, but it's allowing you to go in and see who has what. Uh, here I can see who's owning the file. So in this case here, if I look at the red here, uh, this user A Taft, they're taking up a lot of files across my network. Now that could be for a lot of different reasons. It could be because that person's an administrator and under their credentials, they're creating a lot of the files that are, are being used. It could be for that. It could be actual storage. If I look at uh, these users here, for instance, on this side, we're looking at uh, a much more conservative set of users. So uh, Jay Baker here is not using a lot of my files, for instance. So I can go into more details, but unfortunately I'm getting close to the top of the hour. But uh, Tom, hopefully that gives you a, a brief example of, of the heat map itself. Um, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for all of you that attended. We had a really great attendance today, and I want to wish you all the best of the holidays. I hope you're safe. I hope you have fun. I hope you have a chance to be with people you love. That's all for me. Thank you very much.